I knew we'd be slim a little bit today because of the weather, but I'm glad you're here today. We have some folks gone, but I'm glad you're here. Um, I love this time of the year when, when things are starting to bud, the, the sun is coming out, the weather, the temperature's getting warm, and, and, um, and I just, I don't know, I like spring, I like fall. Uh, I was glad when we had that one good snow because I, I like snow, um, but I, I'm ready for summertime, amen. I just want those sunny days. I was talking to Randy today about putting out my garden, and, and he's going to come over to the house, and, and um, we're going to put out a garden this year, and, and I'm already looking forward to that. In the midst of all this, there's something else going on, the presidential debates, the elections, the, the caucuses, all that stuff going on right now. And there is a movement today, and I'm not preaching on politics, so don't, don't think why well, I'm preaching on politics. There is a movement today where people's trying to stop a guy by the name of Trump. And, uh, I'm, you know, the thing about it is, I don't care who you're for, you know, whether you're for Trump, against Trump. But, you know, what irritates me, and I, I was talking to Randy about this this week, what irritates me is there is definitely a movement going on and he has a momentum going on. And what irritates me is when he, when he does well at a primary or whatever, the establishment will come on and they will say, well, it's not really what it seems like. And I see the figures in front of my eyes. I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not that dumb. You know, I'm, I'm a little bit slow, but I'm not that dumb, you know. When I see the people voting saying, hey, we're tired of status quo and, and this is what we want. I get tired of people trying to tell me it's not like it really is. But you know what? This was going on in Jesus' day. There was a movement going on in Jesus' day where there were people rising up going, hey, there's something different about this guy. There's something to this Jesus. Matter of fact, he would perform miracles, and even the establishment, which were the religious leaders, they would rise up and go, you know what, we can't, we can't, um, that's my guys going by right there. Hey, I'll catch up with you here in a minute. <laughs> I just want to ride, I just want to ride. You know, Lynn and I, we uh, has nothing to do with serving. Lynn and I always said when we retire, we want to get a big hog and we just want to ride. And, uh, and uh, that's my, my guys. And it's a good day to ride, amen? Uh, but yeah, people, even the establishment, the religious leaders were telling the people, it's not like it seems. And Jesus would perform a miracle. Jesus was doing great, great miracle. And they would try to denounce Jesus. They would try to belittle Jesus. They would try to make it seem like it's not what it really is. And just like the elections going on today, like I said, I, I don't care who you vote for. You either have to vote for Trump or against Trump. Same way with Jesus. You're either for Jesus or you're against Jesus. And you have to decide. And today we're going to look at a story of two people. And, and I was really aimed toward one guy. And I realized both of the people are part of the one story. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Luke chapter 8. And it's the story of the day about a guy by the name of Jairus, start with verse 40, going to 56. A guy by the name of Jairus, and then a, 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 a lady, we don't even know her, her name. And when I was looking at the stories, I was thinking they intertwine, and it's really one story of two people. The Bible says, when Jesus was turned... And a crowd welcomed him, for they were all expecting him. Then a man named Jairus, the synagogue leader, came and fell at Jesus' feet, pleading with him to come to his house, because his only daughter, a girl of about 12, was dying. 
as Jesus was on his way, the crowds almost crushed him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years, but no one could heal her. And she came up behind him and she touched the, the edge of his cloak and immediately the bleeding stopped. Who touched me, Jesus asked. And when they all denied it, Peter said, Master, the people are crowding and pressing against you. But Jesus said, Someone touched me. I know that power has gone out from me. Then the woman, seeing that she could not go unnoticed, came trembling and fell at his feet in the presence of all the people. And she told why she had touched him and how she had instantly been healed. Then he said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. Side note, this is the only time in Scripture that Jesus ever said, Daughter, go in peace. While Jesus was still speaking, someone came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead. He said, Don't bother to teach her anymore. Hearing this, Jesus said to Jairus, Don't be afraid. Just believe and she will be healed. And when he arrived at the house of Jairus, he did not let anyone go in with him except Peter, John, and James, and the child's father and mother. Meanwhile, all the people were wailing and mourning for her. Stop wailing, Jesus said. She is not dead but asleep. Hmm. They laughed at him, knowing that, that she was dead, but he took her by the hand and said, My child, get up. Her spirit returned, and at once she stood up. Then Jesus told them to give her something to eat, and her parents were astonished. But he ordered them not to tell anyone what had happened. This is really one story, but it's two people. And I want you to see the difference between the two people and how healing came to both of them. You know, here, here's the thing. Here is a guy by the name of Jairus. It, it mentions him. Here's a woman... It, 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 they don't even mention her name. Here's Jairus. He's the head of the synagogue. And, you know, he, he's in charge. And if you do a study of his job, his job is to line up the pastors, line up the priests, line up the order of worship, line up the sacrifices. He was in charge of the temple. Here's this woman. She can't even get into the temple. Because the Bible says that she had an issue of blood for 12 years and, and she was basically ceremonial, un, unclean. And everybody that she touched was unclean. Any object she touched was unclean. And here's a guy that he's all that and here's a woman that she's not that. He was probably wealthy. She was poor because this story is found in, in two other Gospels where... In Matthew and Mark, it says that for 12 years, she spent all that she had just trying to be healed. And for 12 years, she had this issue. And she's hurting and she's in pain. In 12 years, he's enjoyed his daughter. See, it's a, I mean, just, just a, you know, one extreme to another extreme. But they had one thing in common. They were both hurting. And I want you to understand whether it's a, a physical ailment or an ailment of a child or an ailment of a prodigal son or an ailment of a lost sheep. When you hurt, you hurt. It makes no difference what the hurt. When you hurt, you hurt. And even though they had all these things where they were different, they had one thing in common. Both of them were hurting. The Bible says that Jairus, he ran and he fell at the feet of Jesus. And I want you to know, he put a lot on the line by doing this. Because like I said, there was that movement going on, kind of like the movement against Trump today, where the establishment, you know, the, the Mitt Rotney or, 
you know, different, different politicians are, are lining up saying, hey, we got to stop this guy. There was a movement that day saying, hey, we've got to stop this guy. And by this synagogue leader putting a lot on the line, man, he put pride aside. He put his job aside. He put his social activity aside. He was putting it all aside because he was hurting. And he realized that the only one that could tend to that hurt, the only one that could handle that hurt, the only one that could solve the pain in his heart was a, a man by the name of Jesus. Because evidently he had seen the miracles that Jesus had done. I guess you could say that he was desperate. And you know, if you do a study when it says that he fell at his feet, he probably fell at his feet and he probably kissed the feet of Jesus. A sign of humility. So here's one extreme, a guy that has it all, but then you hear the other extreme with the lady that had nothing. But here's the same thing she had in common with, with Jairus, that she was hurting also. Even though she was poor, she still had the pain. Even though she was nothing in the community, she still hurt. And she did the same thing. She put it all on the line. And, you know, the other gospel says that, that she thought in her mind, if I can just go and touch the hem of his robe, she said, I can be saved. And I think about the truth of these. Both of these people came to Jesus with a great need and a, a great faith in God. And I want you to see this. Jesus looked at both of them in love. He looked at Jairus in love, and, and we'll see here in a second how he went to his house and he healed his daughter. But he looked at this lady that meant nothing in the community with love. I want you to understand that God is very clear. God shows no favoritism. And I want you to, to understand this truth. You can be all that or you can be nothing at all. And the Bible says that God loves us. Aren't you happy about that? Jesus showed love for both of them. And I put this, the truth, the fact that Jesus ministered equally to the outcast woman and the leading elder of the synagogue reveals his divine impartiality. This week I had an opportunity to speak to our young people on Wednesday night over there at the shelter and and, um, and I, I gave them a, a message about how we're all part of the body of Christ. And, and when I was growing up in church as a kid, you know, you would think that we're all part of the body of Christ. But when I was growing up in, as a kid, there were three groups of people that were not on the same playing field. And I grew up in a church that if you were black, you were not welcomed in our church. If you were of another nationality, you weren't welcome in our church. I also shared with our young ladies Wednesday night that I grew up in a time in a, in a church where if you were a female, you were basically to keep your head bowed, looking at the wall, don't say a word. And I also shared with them Wednesday night that if you were young, you were to be seen and not heard. But I go back to what Paul wrote, and I didn't have this for them. Paul wrote in Galatians 28, There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor there is male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. I share with you all the time when I stand before God one day, He's not going to see whether I'm, I'm good, bad. He's not going to see whether I'm rich, poor, black, white, male, female. You know the spiel. All he's going to see is are you covered by the blood of Jesus? Because the Bible's very clear. It's, it's through the blood of Jesus that we have remission of sins. It's through the blood of Jesus that we have forgiveness of sins. 
It's through the blood of Jesus that He covers our sins and He wipes us clean. Just like when He looked at me that, or looked at this lady that day and looked at that man that day, He didn't see whether He was rich, poor, male, female. All He saw was two people that He loved. Here's the a, here's a thing. Both of them wound up at the feet of Jesus. And I want you to understand, when you're going through a trial in your life, there's something to that. The Bible, all through the Bible says that Jesus would touch somebody and they would be supernaturally healed. People would go to the feet of Jesus for a lot of reasons. That day, Jairus went to the, the feet of Jesus and he went to the foot of Jesus with a prayer. Please heal my daughter. The Bible says that he, he begged, he, he appealed to Jesus, please heal my daughter. How many times have you been at the foot of Jesus and you said, God, please heal me. God, I can't do it all. Please take care of this illness there's people in this room you're suffering with something it may be something as simple as arthritis it may be simple as something as you know heartburn but it could be something like cancer or leukemia and just like Jairus you can go to the foot of Jesus and you can say Please heal me. And we know that healing came because uh, his daughter was raised to life. And the lady with the issue of blood, she was healed. So there's healing at the, at the foot of Jesus. And there's five times in the, in the Gospel of Luke where it talks about people that were at the, at the feet of Jesus and God did a supernatural act. There's power at the feet of Jesus. Let, before I look at that, you know, when you go to the feet of Jesus, pride's got to die. Self-righteousness has got to die. A bad attitude's got to die. Making it all about you's got to die. Because when you go to the foot of Jesus, it's not about your pride, and it's not about your arrogance. It's not about your self-righteousness. It's not about you. It's all about Jesus. And when you fall at the feet of Jesus, like I said, pride must. It, it's not, well, it, it's a good thing if it, no, it must die. I go back to the prayer, the, the parable of the two men in the temple praying, and Jesus said, one went away justified, one, one went away just nothing at all. And we know the, the story how the one went to the temple and he prayed all about self. But then the old sinner went to the temple and he prayed, Lord, have mercy on me, a poor, wretched sinner. See, when you fall at the feet of Jesus, everything must die. Everything must go. It's not about you. It's about bringing glory to God. There was a prayer offered at the feet of Jesus. There was healing at the feet of Jesus. Another time when Jesus in, in chapter 8, he, he cast out the demons out of a guy. And the Bible says that when the people came to them, he was sitting at the feet of Jesus and he was all cleaned up. Other, other words, there was a new convert at the feet of Jesus. You think about the lady that was sinful and she received feet Forgiveness at the feet of Jesus. And we, uh, we, we read the story, and I've preached on it, where the lady that was sinful, she came and, and Jesus was at a guy, a Pharisee's house by the name of Simon. And the Bible says that, uh, that, that she came in, this lady, she was questionable reputation, probably a, probably a prostitute. And she went up behind Jesus, and Jesus is reclining at the table. And the Bible says that she brought an alabaster box and she broke it and the tears from her guilt 
and her pain wet the feet of Jesus. And she, she, she just loved on Jesus' feet. And she took her hair and she was wiping Jesus' feet. And she took that alabaster box and she anointed Jesus' feet. And the whole time that, that she's receiving forgiveness, the old hypocrites in the room, the Simons in the room, not Simon Peter, but another Simon, a Pharisee Simon, said if this Jesus knew who was touching him, he would have nothing to do with her. Jesus tells a little story about forgiveness. And then he looks at her and said, your, your sins are forgiven. Your sins are forgiveness. See, there's forgiveness at the feet of Jesus. And see, I like that because some of you are sitting in this room today and you're thinking about what you've done. You're thinking about your past. You're thinking about your decisions you've made. And Jesus says, hey, brother, hey, sister, there's forgiveness. And it happens at the feet of Jesus. I think about another time... Jesus, there's teaching at the feet of Jesus. We, we see in Luke chapter 10 where Mary, we know Mary and Martha and Lazarus, but Mary's at the feet of Jesus and he, she's just soaking in his teaching. And then there's distress at the feet of Jesus where Mary and Martha, their brother Lazarus, had died and Jesus came, you know, four days and their brother's already dead. And the Bible says that Mary and Martha, they fell at Jesus' feet and they said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would have, would have lived. He wouldn't be dead. He would be alive. See, there's distress at the feet of Jesus. There's fear at the feet of Jesus. We're doing our, our study in Revelation in, the, in chapter 1 in Revelation. It talks about when John realized that he was in the presence of Almighty God and he was in the presence of the Lamb of God, which is Jesus, he fell at his feet in fear. But there's worship at the feet of Jesus. Luke 17, when the, when the ten men with, that were lepers were healed. The Bible says that nine left, but the one came back and he went to the feet of Jesus and he worshiped Jesus. I want you to understand a lot of things can happen at the feet of Jesus. But like I said, a lot of the other things must die. You know, self-righteousness, pride, arrogance, bitterness, anger, all that's got to die. Here's the third point. At the feet of Jesus, there's a question being asked. In this story, in the first part of the story, when, when the lady, the issue of blood, she came up behind Jesus and she touched the hem. He asked the question, who touched me? Now I want you to understand, Jesus didn't ask this out of, out of ignorance because he knew exactly who touched him. He said, power has come out of my body. Who touched me? I believe he did this for three reasons. First of all, I think he did it for, for this, this woman with the issue of blood. So that she could have a public declaration of God is awesome. So that she could bring glory to God. But I believe that he said it for a second reason. I think he asked who touched me for the sake of, of Jairus because he knew that Jairus was going to receive the word, hey, your daughter has died. Your daughter's died. Don't, don't trouble the master. But I believe he did it for a third reason, for the crowd. I think it was almost like a rebuke. Because as a matter of fact, Peter said, well, well Lord, Jesus, I mean, they're crushing you. I mean, it's, it's a crowd. They're all around you. Everyone's touching you. And I want you to get this message right here, this point right here. 
You can be close to Jesus and never be touched by Jesus. You can be in the presence of Jesus, in the presence of the Holy Spirit, and never be touched by Jesus. And it all goes back to the heart. If you walk in this place on Sunday mornings and you think, well, God, entertain me. God, do something for me. God, show out for me. But if you walk in this place and you go, Lord, I need you. Lord, I love you. See, I believe Jesus asked that question. Who touched me for her sake, for Jairus' sake, but almost like a rebuke to the crowd. See, all through the Bible, Jesus and God will ask questions. I, I'll go back to the, the Garden of Eden when, when Adam and Eve are hiding from God and, and God's walking in the garden. He asks the question, where are you, Adam? Here, once again, he's, he knew exactly where they're at. He didn't ask this out of ignorance like he couldn't find Adam and Eve. He knew exactly where they were at. But he, he, he asked them a question just to open up dialogue just so that they could go, you know what, we're hiding because we chose poorly, God. God, will you forgive us? I go back to blind Bartimaeus when, when Jesus, when walking by and blind Bartimaeus is, is yelling, Savior Jesus, Lord, save me. And Jesus, you know, the crowd trying to quiet him, he, he yelled even louder, save me. And he goes to blind Bartimaeus and he asks Bartimaeus, what do you want me to do for you? Knowing full well that he's blind. Knowing full well that he wants his sight. But he asked him a question because he wanted Bartimaeus to go, I want to see. I want to be healed. Now here, here's the truth. God knows what you're going through. And when, when you're at his feet, he's going to ask, now what do you want me to do for you? And I believe with all my heart, like Bartimaeus, if he would have never asked for healing, he would have died blind. See, there's a question at the feet of what, what do you want me to do for you? And that's when you, when you go, I, I want this healing to start. I, I want this this, this cancer out of my body. I want this arthritis out of my body. I want this heartburn. God. I want this. I, I, I need a job, God. I tell people all the time, and I've told some of you in this, this room today, you know, people come and they, they say, well, you know, and I have a lot of requests on different things, but, you know, people say, well, I, I'd like to find a good good." good lady or good man and I always tell the same thing and I've told some of you this and I always say start writing a list start making a list of what you want in a, in a man or a woman start making a, and, I, and, I, and I always say be specific you know if you want someone that's a Christian right I want a godly man I want a godly woman if you want someone that, that's not drinking I want someone that won't drink you want someone with a job? I need a man with a job. Ladies, that's a good one right there. And I tell people all the time, even list the things that you don't want. But don't just make a list and never... Make, making that list is the first thing. Start praying over that list. And then later on, don't kind of compromise and we'll go... And go, well, he, I guess I can have a guy that's not a Christian and, and I'll, I'll lead him to Christ. Our job's not that big of a deal. Just send me a man or send me a woman. No, you, keep, you write that list and you start praying over it because God, at the feet of Jesus, he will ask you a question. What do you want? Now, here's the same way with healing. 
Same way, if you need a job, say, God, I mean, make your list and, and start praying over it, saying, I need a job. I need my child to come home. I need healing. See, there was a question asked at the feet of Jesus. And I like this right here. You know, when healing came for Jairus, healing came when he he cast the non-believers out of the room. You notice that when he went to Jairus' house, the Bible says the only one, Peter, James, and John, Jesus, and the father and the mother, they were the only one that went into the room. The crowds are outside laughing at Jesus when he said, you know what? She's just asleep. The non-believers were outside. The Bible says there was a time that Jesus went to his own hometown. And I'm, I'm thinking the Son of God. And the Bible says because of lack of their faith, he was unable to perform many miracles. Not because he's not powerful. Not because he's not God. It's because of lack of their faith. There was no miracles that were performed. In other words, the non-believers were in the crowd. And they were edging on the crowd. And they were saying, oh, this Jesus. We got to put an end to this Jesus. So healing came for Jairus when he put the crowd outside the room and he put the believers inside the room. And I want you to get this point right. If you're going through a trial in your life and if something big is happening in your life and you need healing or you need whatever from God, put the naysayers outside the room. Put the unbelievers outside. Don't let them get in your ear and start yakking. Because here's the truth. My God is powerful. My God is great. My God is still in the miracle business. And glory comes to him when he performs the miracle. And here's the truth. When you're back against the wall and when it looks impossible, that's when God shows out the most. And you know why? Because you won't receive any of the glory and people will know it had to be God. But until that time has, put the naysayers outside. Put the unbelievers outside. And when you pray, don't pray a prayer with the escape clause in it. If you need healing today, pray, God, please take this from me. And don't add that little tag, but if you won't take it from me, God, I, I'm fine with anything. God already knows that. If your heart is like that, he knows that you're fine with it kind of like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, before they're going through the fiery furnace, they said, my God is able to deliver me. But if he won't deliver me, I'm okay with that also. Don't have an escape clause. Pray your prayer and be definite. Kind of like Bartimaeus when Jesus said, what do you want? And he said, I want to be healed. He didn't add a tag to it. Now, if you want him, at least help me send a guide dog my way. He didn't pray that. That's a pretty good one right there. (laughs) Healing started when he put the naysayers out of the room. Right here's the last truth. The same God that I'm talking about with Jairus and this woman with the issue of blood, the same God that healed them, he's the same God we worship. He's the same God we we cry out to. He's the same God that's still on the throne. When I said that healing comes at the feet of Jesus... There's a scripture in the Bible that says that one day, said everyone, said every knee shall bow. 
every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. And I believe that scripture, when it says everyone, it means everyone in this room. You're going to bow one day and you're going to proclaim Jesus is Lord. Now here's the question, where is it going to be? Is it going to be on this side of glory where you go, I stand with Jesus? I'm not ashamed of Jesus. Jesus is my Lord. He's my Savior. He's my King. He's, he's my Redeemer. He's everything to me. Because you will bow. There will be people that bow one day on the other side of glory at the great white throne judgment. And they will bow, and he'll say, depart from me, for I never knew you. But the Bible's very clear. You will bow before God one day. Is he Lord of your life now? I pray that he is. Because the Bible's very clear that we will all bow. You know what I think about? When I read Revelation, and I love this, when it talks about all the worship at the, in the throne room of God and all the saints around the throne room of God and the 24 elders are there and the four beasts, and I mean just everyone is at the throne bowing to Jesus, bowing to God. Your loved one that's already gone on, I can't help, and I have nothing to back this up, but I can't help but believe, according to how everything happened in the New Testament, I can't help but believe this, that your loved one that was a child of God, when they saw Jesus, the first thing they did is they fell at his feet. And they worshipped him. Because they knew who he was. That's Jesus. That's Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you right now. Father, we love you and we praise you. And, and Father, I know I can only answer for myself, but I bow before you. And I'm not, not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus, for it is the power of God for salvation. It is the power of God for, for salvation. It is the power of God for salvation. Father, I, I love you and I praise you. And Father, I thank you for a guy by the name of Jairus. And I, I thank you for a lady that we don't even know her name. Father, I love their story where you loved on both of them in the same way. And Father, you had, you had such a tender love for, for them where you said, daughter, your sins are forgiven. Your healing is here. Daughter, you just go and live your life. And I love the tenderness where you told Jairus, don't worry. Don't be afraid. I'm going to heal your daughter. You just stand strong, Jairus. I'm going to heal your daughter. Father, there's times that you whisper sweet words in our ears when it looks bad and it looks look bleak and, you, and we feel like there's no answer and you whisper in our ears, don't worry, don't be afraid, I'm here. Father, you, you made us a promise. You said you would never leave us nor forsake us. And Father, you are so real to me. And Father, the world can say that there's not a God, but I know there is because I talked to you this morning. Father, I pray if there's anyone in this room this morning that whatever they're going through, Father, I pray that they'll come to this altar and they will just lift it up to you. Unashamedly just bowing at the feet of Jesus where they don't care what others think. Where they don't, where they don't worry about what some others may think about them, what they may say, what they may talk about. 
they will come and they will just bow at your feet. And Father, ask them that question, what do you want me to do? And Father, just let them be specific with you. Father, it's my prayer if there's anyone that, in this room this morning that, that needs Jesus as Lord and Savior that, that they'll receive you today. And Father, that's why Bradley and I stand over here on each side where people, if they need to pray with us, where we can help tell them how they can find Jesus. So, Father, I guess what I'm trying to say, help us to continue to worship you. And, Father, help us to fall on our knees at your feet. And, Father, we love you and we praise you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.